Good afternoon. Hello, guys. Nice to see Good you. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Weekend is coming, but looks like also coming to some cold weather. Winter is coming too. Yeah. Quite early winter is coming in Kazakhstan. Yes, it is. Yeah, but probably in Almaty, it's not so bad. In thousand parts. Actually, we have 25 degrees yesterday, so it's still like warm. Yeah, yeah, sure, it is. It is, I agree, but I believe not for long. Are you in Astana right now? Or yeah, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, last discussion, we introduced um, center of mass, the concept, and also shown how to calculate this for a one-dimensional case. Mm -hmm. So also last time uh, I was asked if it's possible to show how to do this calculation for a three-dimensional case, some continuous body in three dimensions. Uh, so I answered in general terms on how this should be approached, but uh, I believe that we can squeeze this in, try to make it uh, like combined with this propulsion uh, motion. Um, I hope we will have enough time and actually quite um, important uh, to feel and see once how to uh, do these calculations for this in general form for three-dimensional case because that could be useful for some other uh, uh, reasons specifically in you will deal with this a bit in uh, uh, not calculating center of mass, but integrating all over the volume for some continuous bodies in uh, physics too, when you study electricity. So I believe that would make uh, sense to go through it and uh, give some example. So we will consider now um, semi-sphere, because sphere is a bit uh, kind of boring because due to symmetry, um, if we place it in the origin of the system of coordinates, um, the center of mass will be the center of the sphere. However, if we have a semi-sphere for x, y, for instance, uh, plane, it will be in the center. However, for z, since it's not symmetric in one direction, uh, it will be um, shifted from the center. And that's what we will uh, try to calculate now. Um, let me change the screen. And let us go through it. So, as I mentioned, we consider a hemisphere. So we have X, Y, Z. Mm. Extend here. Then we have how to draw it. Okay, don't judge my drawing capabilities. I try my best. So, <clears throat> hemisphere, this is the radius of this hemisphere. It's uh, full with, so it's not empty uh, shell. It's uh, half of, of a uh, 
field sphere. <clears throat> so what do we do now? Um, there are several approaches to solve this. Uh, for instance, you can go for easier approach. It's a little bit less uh, time consuming and less calculation heavy. Uh, you can consider some element of volume as a disk uh, with a sickness delta uh, dz. And uh, uh, then you will integrate just only along axis uh, z. Um, however, I believe it's not the best Example, it's easier, but it's better to consider most general case when uh, we uh, use, as I described uh, last uh, lecture when answering to this question, um, when we utilize the features of a spherical uh, system of coordinates and define elementary volume of the uh, space uh, in terms of these parameters uh, used in the spherical system of coordinates. So let us first define what these are. So um, here is our system of coordinates, uh, x, y, z, then assume that we have some radius r. And this radius can draw some area on the surface of this uh, imaginary sphere, which uh, this radius can determine. So, we will have several angles. First, we will have angle theta between z and this uh, radius vector. Uh, then, if we have a projection of this radius on the xy plane, this will be projection of this um, radius. Then here will be some angle P, which will define its uh, position of this uh, point um, in the XY plane. So projection of this radius on XY plane, this will be R times sinus theta. Uh, it will be, um, and given the length of this projection, and then position of the point uh, where this radius is showing uh, will be defined by this angle phi uh, on the xy plane. Uh, and subsequently, we will get also uh, position at uh, axis z, uh, as uh, uh, r times cosinus theta. Uh, then we can get from here uh, positions at the long axis uh, y and x. Uh, <clears throat> that will be uh, r. Sorry. r sinus theta times um, for y axis, we will get uh, cosinus p, and for this is for y, this is for z, this is for x, we will get r uh, sinus theta times um, sinus p. So that's how we go from. Uh, linear system of coordinates to 
spherical system of coordinates. Now we need to define some elementary volume. So again, let us draw separately so we don't clutter too much on one plot. X, Y, Z. So if we deal with these angles in as uh, uh, measure them in radians, so then we can write the following. So this is some element of the surface, some sphere with radius R. So this segment will be given a bit later. We will start from this segment. So this will be nothing else as R. So let's see in order to make it clear. It will be drawn this uh, segment when we move um, radius R by angle D theta, because we measure theta from here. So this, the length of this segment will be R times D theta. So we remember the definition of uh, angles in radians um, that radius times angle in radians gives us the length, uh, like length of the segment of the uh, circle. So this is our segment of the circle here. And here also the same. So let us clean this part. We don't need it now. This segment will be already a bit different because we need to consider this projection of radius R on X, Y plane. And this projection of this segment will be this segment on X, Y plane. So we have R and some new position of this radius. And this angle will be D um, P. But length of this projection here will be not R, but R times sinus theta. We defined it here. So R times sinus theta, right? R times sinus theta. So this will be then R times sinus theta times D phi. So we defined this side and this side. So we can now calculate the area. However, we need the uh, volume. So volume means that we need to consider this part, which will be dr. It changed in the radius. If we push it further or push it back closer to the um, center um, of the coordinate, uh, then we will draw with this uh, area some volume in space. And this will be some elementary volume dV. Uh, and dV, this elementary volume, in eventually will be one side like area times uh, dr. So it will be, uh, we need to multiply actually all sides of this um, elementary volume. So it will be r times d theta times r sinus theta d v 
times dr. Okay, didn't I miss anything? This is first part, this is second part, this is third part. Now, if we rearrange this a bit, it will be r square times sinus theta times d theta d p d r. Okay, looks like we have definition of this elementary volume. And uh, so this is in spherical system of coordinates and in a linear system of coordinates, it would be just dx times dy times dz. However, since we have this uh, symmetry feature of a sphere, uh, it is convenient to use spherical system of uh, coordinates. Until this moment, any questions? Uh, because that should be crystal clear because based on this, we will proceed further. How we define this elementary volume in the spherical system of coordinates. Okay, looks like Clear. Good. Then we keep this in mind and finally proceed with calculation of the center of mass. So uh, we see that we, there is only one axis, axis Z, along which we are interested to calculate the center of mass because along axis X and Y, uh, it will be uh, in the center, in the origin of the coordinates, it will be zero for X and Y. Um, but for uh, Z, it will be different. So Z center of mass coordinate uh, by like in general definition will be triple integral over all surface, uh, sorry, all, all volume, um, Z coordinate times What's going on? Uh, raw density, like volume density, as a function of x, y, z. It could be function of all independent variables. Time uh, times elementary volume. So it will be dx times dy times dz. Okay, so as you remember, this product gives us this elementary mass, dm. And this should be divided by the total mass of the body. So it will be triple integral over the volume, a product of density as a function of x, y, and z, um, times dx, d y times dz. Okay, so this is the general uh, equation for calculating this um, position of the center of mass along axis uh, z. Now, we assume we are not enemies to ourselves, and we assume that rho is constant. We don't go for these functions. If this is true, then we can cancel this out. So it wouldn't be possible if rho is not constant, we need to integrate. But if it's a constant, we put it out from the integrals uh, and um, it will be canceled out. So eventually for uniform density all over this, this continuous body, we will get the following equation, triple integral over the volume, z times dx dy dz, divided by integral over the volume, dx dy dz. So uh, this and this, as I mentioned before, these are elementary volume. 
<clears throat> we can write, make it already crystal clear. Uh, integral over the volume, z times dv, integral over the volume, dv. Okay. So now we need to substitute technically everything what we uh, did, uh, we wrote on the previous uh, slide in terms of uh, like in the scope of the spherical system of coordinates, expression for Z and expression for DV. So let us do it on the next slide. So Z center of mass, is equal. Uh, Z, uh, so here we have integral over volume. Uh, instead of Z, we put um, R times cosinus theta. We wrote it down previously. Uh, times dV and dV, we also wrote down it would be r square times sinus sinus theta times d v times d r times d theta this is our numerator and our denominator will be just dv so it will be r square sinus theta d p d r d theta okay good so we have actually two integrals this let's consider this is uh let's write like this it will be i1 and i2 so first, uh, let's start from the uh, easy one, from I2. I uh, this is nothing else because we have integral. This is, we can write it here, integral over the volume for d, dv. And uh, obviously, this is the total volume nothing else as total volume. So we integrate all, uh, like sum up all small volumes of this body and end up with a total volume. So we don't need to spend time integrating this because we know actually what you can do at home if you are interested. Uh, this is the way how you derive this well-known equation for the volume of a sphere. So volume of a sphere is equal to, uh, do you remember equation for the volume of the sphere, of a sphere? Four over three pi r uh, cubic. Exactly, thank you. So this is the volume of the sphere, how you get it? You solve this triple integral uh, with the following uh, ranges. So uh, for phi, it changes from zero to two pi, 360 degrees, because it uh, shows, it changes, like rotates all around, it's a sphere. And uh, uh, for theta, it changes from, zero to uh, pi. Yeah, it's 180 degrees. It goes from uh, vertical orientation up to vertical orientation down. And R is changing from zero to R, which is radius of the sphere. If you substitute these ranges and solve this uh, triple integral, this is the way how you derives this well-known uh, equation. That's why I think this approach from the general, general approach for calculation uh, would make sense because it will 
provide you some um, understanding where it comes from. Uh, so this is total sphere, but we have semi-sphere, so we need to divide this by, by two. So it multiplied one uh, by one half. And uh, eventually we will get for this integral I2, uh, it will be uh, two over three, two third pi R U. So this is our integral I2. Okay. That we can write here, it will be equal to two over three pi R three. Let us now delete this so it doesn't take our space. And uh, now we focus on the first integral. So the first integral I1, oops, I1 is equal. So first we have here d phi, it changes uh, also in semi-sphere, uh, uh, it changes uh, uh, from zero to two pi. So let me show it on the figure. It's here, you see, uh, this is our phi. And this is the bottom of our semi-sphere. In order to draw this circle, we need to change phi from zero to two pi. Okay, so from zero to two pi, we have O D phi. Then we have for the um, radius. Radius obviously is changing from zero to uh, R capital, which is radius of the sphere. And uh, uh, here we have R and R squared. So it will be R cubed dr. And then one more integral uh, for theta. Theta is changing uh, from 0 to uh, pi over 2, one half of pi. Again, if we look here, this is uh, like if we show here this theta, in order to draw semi-sphere, so it should change from this point to this point. And means that our theta should change from uh, zero when we are here to pi over two, 90 degrees when we are here. So it will be from zero, zero to pi over two. And we have cosine theta times sine theta times d theta. Cosine theta times sine theta times d theta. Okay, let us solve it. It will be, uh, here we can write two pi. Uh, here will be for, second integral, let's write r in the power of four divided by four from zero to r. <clears throat> and the third integral, uh, so you should know or check in the table of uh, derivatives that uh, derivative of sine is theta gives us cosine theta. So what we can do we can put this cosine under the sine of differential, and that will be integral of sine is theta times d sine is theta. So let us write it here so you know what we are doing. Sine is theta times d sine is theta. And now we can we have the same variable here and here, so we can integrate it as x dx, which is very uh, convenient. 
Uh, so here will be two pi times r in the fourth power divided by four uh, times this integral. So it will be uh, sinus square theta divided by two from zero. So theta is changing from zero to pi over two. Okay, so this, when we substitute pi over two is 90 degrees sinus, um, 90 degrees is unity, unity in second power is unity. So it will, we will have just one half the integral. Uh, this uh, third integral is equal to one half. So it will be uh, we can cancel. Let's write it down everything because r four over four times one half. So we cancel these guys and. Uh, we eventually get pi times r in the fourth power divided by four. So this is our integral i1. We solved it. And now we, in order to get the center of mass, we need to take the ratio i1, which is this guy divided, sorry, I1, which is this guy, divided by I2, which is this guy. So let us do it. So Z center of mass is equal to I1 divided by I2. This will be pi R in the fourth power divided by four divided, let's check what is two third pi in the uh, times r in the third power. Two third pi r in the third power. And from here, we can cancel this pi. We can uh, move this uh, three in numerator and these two guys will be in denominator. And also we cancel this and this. So eventually we get uh, three eighths of R. So that is our answer. So if we have this situation, X, Y, Z, and here is our semi-sphere. The center of uh, mass will be at some point here along uh, axis Z as the distance from the origin, uh, three eighths of the radius of the sphere. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, coordinate along Z and along, so we can write a Z center of mass and X center of mass is equal to Y center of mass and this is equal to zero. So this is the <coughs> answer how we calculate center of mass for this three-dimensional uh, object, a continuous object um, and uh, quite in general uh, form. So we uh, considered in a spherical system of coordinates in order to uh, use the advantage of the spherical symmetry. And uh, uh, this is the way how you do it. If you have some cylinder, uh, you will go for a polar system of coordinates in order to adjust to this um, case. Okay, so now we still have some time.
and we need to discuss the uh, proportion, proportion motion. Hopefully we will have enough time to do it. <laughs> so proportion motion is a rocket proportion motion. Uh, as the case, I would say very interesting case of application of uh, conservation of linear momentum, when we have motion of a body with changing mass. So um, fuel, like rocket fuel is burning, there's some exhaust gas, which flies out from the rocket um, with certain speed, like velocity. And um, obviously over time, the total mass of the rocket reduces uh, because part of the fuel is burned. So this should be taken into account. So let us consider <coughs> rocket which is moving with some velocity. Here is mass of the rocket plus some mass of the fuel. And when it burns out, there will be mass of the rocket itself. This fuel will be in the form of exhaust gases with velocity V exhaust in opposite direction. And this velocity of the rocket will uh, change. It will be V plus some delta V. And of course, for this case, we apply uh, conservation of a linear moment. <laughs> So let us start with this. So capital M plus delta M times V. So it's initial linear momentum. We consider absolute values. Uh, then we have M times V plus delta V after this fuel was burned and rocket was accelerated uh, plus delta M. And here we need to put uh, not just V exhaust, but because V is velocity uh, of the rocket with respect to ground. So here we also need to put velocity of uh, exhaust gases with respect to ground because VE, just VE, its velocity vector of exhaust gases with respect to the rocket. So uh, velocity vector with respect to the ground, actually it's projection on one dimensional case, absolute value, uh, will be V minus VE. Okay, now let us open this parenthesis. Will be capital M times V plus delta M times V, V equal to M times V plus M times delta V plus delta M times V minus delta M times V E. So what do we have here? We cancel out these guys, cancel out these guys. So we can write that M delta V is equal to VE times delta M. So that's technically, um, for both cases, it's uh, linear momentum. Uh, here we have mass of the uh, rocket times change uh, of its velocity, like change of linear moment. Um, and here is velocity, which is constant, exhaust velocity of uh, the gases times uh, change of the mass, how much 
of these uh, gases were produced. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, both gives, uh, give us uh, change of the linear moment. So that is in some long interval of time. Let's say we have full rocket and an empty rocket, uh, but it takes time to, to burn this fuel. So we need to go to some uh, limit and consider some instantaneous conditions. So in the limit of delta t approaches zero, this delta v approaches some very small change in velocity dv, delta m also approaches some very change in uh, like burned uh, fuel dm. Uh, and uh, we also can write that dm, this very small change in the uh, burned fuel, will be equal minus d capital M. Uh, so it will be like negative uh, change of the mass of the rocket, because if we burn fuel, the mass of the rocket reduces. So um, if this is positive, this is negative. OK, next step. We need to write, uh, instead of this equation, we will end up now with some differential. It will be uh, mass of the rocket times dv equal to v exhaust times dm. So here we would like to substitute dm with minus d capital M in order to uh, match with this capital M. It will be minus ve times d capital M. And with uh, uh, redistribution of these uh, variables, we will get dv is equal to minus ve dm over m. So this is a simple differential equation, which we can uh, solve by integrating left and right side. So we proceed further to the next slide. So it will be integral from uh, initial velocity to final velocity for dv is equal to minus v exhaust integral from initial mass to final mass of the rocket uh, dm over m. So we can write that integral is from table of integrals dx over dx, uh, sorry, dx over x is equal to natural logarithm of x plus c is when we have undefined integrals. So here we have defined integrals um, and uh, let us take this integral. So it will be v from v initial to v final equal to minus v exhaust times natural, natural logarithm of capital M, mass of the rocket from initial to final. So this will be V final minus V initial, which we can set initial to zero, for instance, so we don't need to deal with this anymore. We start from the beginning. Uh, equal to minus V exhaust times natural logarithm of final mass of the rocket minus natural logarithm of initial mass of the rocket. So if you remember properties of the logarithm, so the difference of logarithms is logarithm of the ratio minus VE 
are actually, we don't need parentheses here, will be natural logarithm of final mass of the rocket divided by initial mass of the rocket. And another property of the logarithms, if we have minus, so we can flip this uh, argument of the, uh, the ratio in the argument of the um, logarithm. So it will be VE times natural logarithm of MI over M final. Okay, so eventually we get, assuming that initial velocity is zero, we get V uh, final, let's call it uh, V rocket, is equal to V exhaust times natural logarithm of initial mass to final mass of the rocket. So this is the key equation we wanted to derive. And here we see that V rocket increases. That's what we want. We want faster rockets. Uh, when V exhaust increases, so when we burn uh, our fuel at higher temperatures, that's very important. And uh, uh, also uh, when the ratio of initial mass to final mass also increases. So uh, ideally, in order to get maximum uh, uh, velocity, you need to um, fill the rocket completely with the fuel. So it should be uh, maximum initial uh, mass and minimum final mass. Um, but obviously that doesn't work. You need some useful load to send to space, uh, either some satellites or astronauts or goods for the International Space Station. Uh, you need to find a compromise between the maximum um, velocity which can be reached by the rocket and some necessary load, useful load which should be delivered. So here you also have compromise, and that is uh, properties of the fuel. The compositions are designed in that way that uh, fuel burns at maximum temperature, but also material science limits. So uh, materials like rocket should not be melted while it moves. Uh, so it's material science and also engineering solutions for active cooling of the exhaust part of the um, rocket with liquid nitrogen, for instance, which is used as an uh, oxidizer for the fuel to get maximum um, burning temperature. Uh, first, it goes through these shields of the rocket to cool it down. Liquid nitrogen is very cold. It's actually why you see before launching some uh, rockets and shuttles, um, this uh, like uh, um, uh, icy cover on uh, on rockets. That's because of evaporation of liquid uh, oxygen and other uh, liquidized fuels, uh, uh, which are which consist like form the the in combination fuel rocket fuel, um, and that's very efficient way of of cooling before uh, liquid oxygen is transported towards a burning reactor. Uh, so another thing what we need to highlight here is the force exerted by, uh, like exerted on, on the um, rocket. So we can write that this is, uh, total mass times dv over dt, like um, that is our second law of motion, m times a, but taking into account this differential equation, which we wrote previously, 
uh, that m times dv might is equal to minus ve times dm. Uh, so uh, from here we can show that uh, this force can be represented also in a different form, absolute value of ve times uh, dm over dt. Uh, so technically it's the same. So here we have constant mass and changing velocity, uh, constant mass of the rocket and changes, changing velocity of the rocket. Uh, here we have uh, constant velocity of exhaust gases and changing mass of the rocket. Uh, in uh, dimensions, it's all the same. It gives us change of the linear um, momentum uh, over time, which is the force. And from here, we see that in order to get higher force exerted on this rocket, like higher propulsion uh, force, uh, we need, again, increase exhaust velocity and also increase this dm over dt, which is burning rate. So how much of um, fuel we burn uh, per unit time. So obviously in order to get higher force and eventually higher um, acceleration and uh, speed, final speed of the rocket, we need to increase this burning rate. So we need to design this rocket in that way that fuel will be burned as quickly as possible. Uh, but that already also puts limits on from the point of view of material science because materials should withstand this uh, high pressure and uh, extremely high temperatures. So uh, you can make such construction, but it will wait a lot and it will not fly anywhere. So it's always finding a compromise between uh, requirements to gain the maximum velocity and uh, force uh, and still uh, be able to uh, keep uh, this rocket in one piece and safely uh, deliver uh, what is necessary to this space or some stationary orbit. Okay, this is everything what I wanted to tell you for today. And with this, we finish the discussion of this um, concept of uh, conservation of linear momentum, and we'll proceed um, further with our course uh, next week. So you don't have any questions. I wish you good weekend, take care, and see you on Monday. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Bye.